uh, we continue with the next talk, um, which will be an industry talk by Smith and Nephew. And I will quickly introduce um, the company and the speaker. So uh, Smith and Nephew is a British multinational medical equipment manufacturing company headquartered in Wedford, England. It is an international producer of advanced wound management products, arthroscopy products, trauma and clinical therapy products, and orthopedic reconstruction products, um, which are sold in over 100 countries. Uh, we are excited to welcome Costa Niku, a senior principal robotics engineer at Smith & Nephew. Okay, I'll say all that again. So thanks to everybody for the great talk so far and, and thanks for the introduction. Um, and also thanks to Dr. Johnson for teeing up orthopedics. Uh, that was a, a, a great primer in some of the concepts and things that I'll be demonstrating today. Um, as I was, uh, as, in the, in the, as was in the introduction, Smith & Nephew is a multinational um, orthopedics and wound management uh, division. Uh, I am with the robotics group, uh, and so things like augmented reality kind of fall into my domain. Uh, I work in the advanced research division of the robotics group, so things like AR and navigation and robotics uh, are kind of where I play. So just a little bit about me, uh, since this is a fairly personal talk, I have a very specific perspective. And so I'll be going through kind of my career and some of the things that I've worked on and some of the things uh, we're continuing to work on. Um, but the, the reason I, I am involved here is that I have a bit of a past in doing augmented reality, particularly in orthopedics. Um, I was introduced earlier in the discussions today as being a, a contributor to orthopedic augmented reality. Uh, I'd say that I'm more of a dabbler than a contributor, but I was fortunate enough to be associated with a, a great research group at Carnegie Mellon University that kind of got my feet wet uh, and uh, been a part of some of the early uh, AR that was done uh, conceptually and then and really just had the chance to kind of follow it along and, and, and dabble. Um, but still working on uh, getting it out and you know, that translation effort getting into the hands of surgeons kind of on a mass scale. Uh, I worked on Image Overlay, which is the name of the project at Carnegie Mellon, and I'll talk a lot about that project. Uh, my background is a computer science and robotics major, uh, and my thesis was uh, part of the HIPNAF project, which was in computer assisted HIP planning. And we took the project Image Overlay into a startup company called uh, Blue Belt Technologies, uh, which I, I moved to after university. Uh, and and after Blue Belt was acquired by Smith and Nephew in 2016, I remained interested and have been working on, on AR uh, at, at Smith and Nephew since then. Um, to continue along with the theme of the previous presenters, I have a lot of old uh, pictures and, and videos from the 90s and 2000s, so hopefully everybody will indulge me in some of those. Uh, and uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Franco Yarmaz, who's been my advisor and is my current boss and, and really my mentor through my whole career, uh, and also uh, the Mars team for uh, inviting me to this and giving me a chance to present. So as I said, you know, just to summarize, I'll, I'll be talking about kind of my personal progression through university, a uh, startup company, and a big corporate now at Smith & Nephew being a, a big company, and then with a little bit of commentary at the end on whether or not uh, augmented reality is really ready for prime time, particularly in orthopedics. This, this talk will be very orthopedics, particularly joint reconstruction focused, but I'll talk a little bit about uh, some sports medicine applications too. So first we'll start off with ancient history. Um, in, in doing some augmented reality uh, talk research, just looking, mining through Google, I, I kind of happened on kind of the, the fundamental here of, of AR. Uh, and for those that know, or, or per, even have perhaps remember, um, AR was really invented back in the 60s by Ivan Sutherland with the sort of Damocles, which was really the name of the tracking system that was used to track the headset. Uh, and, and at the end of the day, it's just kind of ironic to see, you know, how much things have changed, but also in a way almost how little has changed. Um, I, I recommend anyone looking this up and seeing the actual video taken from the headset on YouTube. It's, it's pretty fascinating to see what they were able to do back then and, and how well it worked um, in, in comparison to where we are today. But my personal uh, history in augmented reality was really uh, in, in the late 90s when I was introduced to it uh, through my work at the university. Uh, and this was the state of VR um, back then. You know, we, we can look back and laugh now, but this was you know, considered the future of gaming and the future of experience. Uh, and and it, I think it continued to be um, demonstrated to be the future. Um, but still, uh, you know, the question I'll be raising here today is, is really whether or not it is the present. 
So I, I started off in, in, in medical robotics at the uh, what was called the Mr. Cass Lab, uh, Medical Robotics and Computer Assisted Surgery, as part of the main flagship project there was HIPNAV. Uh, HIPNAV was uh, the brainchild of, of the team there, particularly Dr. DeJoya and Dr. Yermaz, um, and really doing the first set of, of navigation around the, the hip joint. Um, this uh, was award-winning research. The Ottawa Frank Award from the Hip Society was awarded to this, uh, where we were doing CT-based planning and navigation of the acetabular component in surgery. This is uh, the, the back of my head here, working on our, our preoperative planner and the first uh, hip navigation interface. Uh, again, very similar to what you see today, yet you can see that the style is a little bit uh, old-fashioned. And I started with the lab in 1996 uh, when I was a junior uh, at CMU as a computer science major. But there are other projects within the lab. Um, not only uh, did the HIPNAV spawn a lot of sub-projects within it, but it kind of spawned some kind of connected projects, one of which was, was the image overlay project that, that I talked about. Um, you can see here in the concept picture on the right, you know, the idea was this sort of magic window interface where the surgeon would have effectively x-ray vision. And, and this was a dream that a lot of other groups had had, and, and it was something that we were pursuing as well again, focused on orthopedic applications, um, but really something that was uh, kicked off uh, around 1996, 97, um, but also uh, you know, in parallel with uh, a few other uh, centers for research, uh, namely kind of the innovators from my perspective back then was really kind of this group uh, at UNC. Um, it, I was delighted to see one of the earlier presentations, uh, one of the illustrations from, from Andre State, uh, on the left, some, some magnificent illustration work that's done and still available there on the web um, from the work that was done there at, at uh, UNC. Uh, and you can see that, that it's interesting, again, the sort of concepts that we lay, lay out today uh, and some of the applications, such as this navigated ultrasound view uh, here, is, is still what we're pursuing today. The hardware keeps getting better and cheaper and faster, um, but we can still you know, admit that we unfortunately don't have this in practice. We're still developing better and better ways to do it, uh, but not necessarily, uh, you know, getting it over the line. And some of the contemporary work that we did uh, back at CMU, uh, we were in a partnership with a large NIH-funded grant and, and, and working with groups uh, at MIT and, and Brigham and Women's, uh, but also in, in Johns Hopkins. So uh, Dr. Xu, um, you know, mentioned the group with... Uh, that was uh, Russ Taylor was part of. Uh, we may have met in the past, Dr. Shu, uh, way back, and we were working kind of as contemporaries in our in our separate places uh, because we had that great partnership across across groups. But unfortunately, we didn't work together on on AR. Um, but again, these are some of the, the the early concept photos and some of the work that was published uh, right around the time of the image overlay project, which uh, we uh, published about in 1998 in the Mackay. Um, Image overlay started off as a, as a very large project from a physical perspective. Uh, you can see here on the left, this is kind of our, our initial concept prototype, large frame, large mirror, et cetera. Uh, and eventually we, we evolved it into smaller and smaller form factors and I'll work through those uh, as I go through the talk. But it's interesting to look back at the original hardware. Um, you know, Our first prototype was, uh, like I said, a large, um, large frame. Uh, hopefully you can see my laser pointer. This was made of 80-20, basically something large and sturdy enough to hold a large CRT monitor which we use our, as our display. Uh, we had some shuttering goggles from stereographics that were tracked with a, a small tracker attached to the side. And of course, the whole frame was tracked as well with an attached infrared uh, tracking marker that was tracked by a, a Northern Digital OptiTrack 3020, one of, the, one of the first of these sorts of navigation cameras as they call them now. Um, something in the order of, uh, you know, close to $100,000 for that technology uh, in conjunction with, uh, at the time, a, a ridiculously expensive graphics workstation, uh, the SGI Onyx, which we happened to get as part of kind of a joint research grant. And this is what we got to play with. And as a, as a grad student uh, and a student researcher, I, I was delighted to work with this kind of cutting edge technology to do crazy new novel things like 3D texture maps. Um, when, you know, when you diving into kind of the extensions of OpenGL to try out 3D texture mapping for the first time. Uh, this was kind of the cool things that we had to work, work with. Uh, but you can see from a, from a implementation perspective and kind of ergonomics perspective, this is pretty laughable uh, looking at uh, the way things are today. We did evolve. Uh, we moved forward 
uh, and, and tried to get things a little bit more compact. Uh, and so this was our attempt really at, at a first kind of clinically possible application, uh, thinking about the design of the, the, uh, of the device as well as the way it might be used in the operating room. Uh, and so uh, we had a few different sorts of demonstrations we see here, kind of an ACL prototype that we were doing here with, with a brand new flat panel display, which was newly available. Um, <clears throat> but also thinking about the operating room and how you might deploy it. Uh, this particular model was designed so that the arms could detach. Uh, the arms came off and as, as well as the beam splitter, and those were meant to be sterilized um, before the procedure where the, the, the display would be bagged. Uh, and you know we didn't get much farther than a prototype, but we did get into the operating room uh, after hours, admittedly, um, but to try to, to, to play with this in the real operating room environment uh, and to check out things like lighting, how the bag affected the display. Uh, and, and we did this with the Sawbones model, but again, you can see the surgical setup here. Uh, Dr. DeJoy is looking through the beam splitter device, which catches the, the reflection coming from the monitor, uh, and he's doing an acetabular navigation uh, application uh, where you can see the cup inside of the pelvis, which was registered um, to the CT scan that we took from the model. Uh, and he was able to kind of look at the footprint of the acetabulum and any other navigation information kind of overlaid onto the patient. This demonstration kind of had the next more compact set of, of hardware uh, we downsized in our in our SGI uh, systems. This was using a, a desktop workstation, um, and uh, again we used the OptiTrack, and, and, and of course uh, I, I spoke a little bit more about the more lightweight frame. And really, in the lab, we iterated and iterated as we could, you know, pushing the technology, um, you know, leveraging the existing funding that kept the lab going. And and sometimes we would have grants that funded the project specifically, and other times we had grants that uh, funded the efforts. Um, and generally, uh, and then we try to iterate where we can. You know, everything from um, doing these OR trials to, to you know, giving demos to our, our, our local senators. This is our inspector from Pennsylvania here, um, getting a tour of Carnegie Mellon, and then really trying to stretch and, and get new equipment and try these concepts out. Um, this is one of the first retinal scanning displays. This is the all red um, laser scanner, uh, which I, I unfortunately can't remember the name of this device, but. It was one of the first head-mount displays that was using retinal scanning, uh, and we applied the, the, the code to, to this to, to check it out. And it, it was truly terrible from a display perspective, but it was really cool to be shooting lasers into your eye for the first time. We continued to downsize, and, and, and we pushed towards, again, more, more ergonomic uh, content. Uh, this was an image overlay. We started to call it image overlay in a box. In this case, we were using kind of some new small lightweight laptop technology that we, we threw into this box and put the display here in the back and then a, the beam splitter at the front and you would simply peer through the holes which would allow you to locate your eye position relative to the display we would track it using the tracking markers uh, on, mounted on the side of the device and uh, you'll kind of get an idea here from the movie go from here So this is Dave, he was our intern at the lab at the time and, and actually ironically works for us at Smith and Nephew as one of our lead software engineers. So there you have it. If you squint, you can see that this is running at a, a quick 14 frames per second uh, and, and fairly noticeable lag in both the rendering and the tracking, but this was as, as good as we could do at the time. But Pretty compelling images, nonetheless. Uh, I, I'm, I'm thinking that this is the sort of thing that Dr. Johnson was talking about uh, and wanting to do ACL reconstruction and wanting to see kind of macroscopically uh, the sorts of uh, alignment of your tools and the bones um, with the ability to kind of give more detailed navigation information on top. So we worked on image overlay as part of, as part of um, the Mr. Cass Labs fodder, and that's about as far as we took it as a lab. Um, but fortunately, we were actually able to inspire some other work, and I wanted to make a special note here for the Sonic Flashlight Project, which was also spawned out of Carnegie Mellon uh, by George Stetton, who I believe got cut his teeth at Johns Hopkins uh, and, and came, became a, a professor both at University of Pittsburgh and Carnegie Mellon. And he had a really great idea, which again, I wanted to kind of promote here. Um, this is called the Sonic Flashlight, as I said, and rather than deal with the tracking, um, 
limitations that you have with, at the time, the very large cameras. Uh, his idea was that uh, to mount everything together and use small displays uh, and, and perfectly uh, configured uh, physical mirror and transducer placements to give you uh, live ultrasound visualization really aligned with the, the user's vision. So you can see here, and this is a tough picture, um, essentially as you look through the mirror, you will see the image of the ultrasound projected on onto the patient, but in full quote unquote 3D, because you are seeing a 2D image on the display. So you'll see a floating 2D image inside of the patient. Uh, and uh, it's aligned properly to where the data is supposed to be because you've physically configured everything properly and then done the right uh, image processing to, to calibrate the object in the right spot. A, a genius idea and, and a very compelling uh, technology that unfortunately hasn't really seen um, it, itself hit the market uh, despite every intention by, by Dr. Stetton. Uh, it didn't make it out in the prime time, but again, I wanted to give a shout out to George here during the talk because again, super compelling uh, novel technology that um, came out of Carnegie Mellon. Uh, around the same time as our work in image overlay. So uh, at the end of my time at the at the lab, the, the HipNav group actually had spawned off a company called Casurgica to try to commercialize um, the HipNav uh, project into a HipNav product. Uh, and I was loosely affiliated with that project as, as anyone that's part of a, um, you know, a research lab that spins off a company uh, can appreciate. Uh, and later on, I got a chance to, to, to join a startup that was actually also spun out of the same lab, but was around handheld robotics that was called Bluebelt Technologies. And so I, I joined as, as employee number one, the software lead, the one guy that was working on code while everybody else was administrative. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about that that time next. So this is Bluebelt around 2010, but the company was funded in, in 2004 when we got some funding from the NIH. And, and really the, the concept around Bluebell was to commercialize handheld smart robotics that was used to do either orthopedics or, or spine or cranial applications. And the idea was that we have a tool, it's being tracked by navigation hardware and the system as it knows, because it's based on images and based on tracking technology, uh, it knows when to cut and when not to cut. And we called this technology precision freehand sculpting for the longest time, uh, but we figured we needed something snappier uh, when we wanted to go to market. And so what we did is we, we rebranded it as Navio uh, and we took it from concept to multiple prototypes and, and eventually got enough funding to, to fund the FDA application and, and commercialize uh, uh, the product Navio under the Blue Belt Technologies flag. And ultimately we started uh, in orthopedics. Uh, Navio supported partial knee replacement first uh, and then expanded into total knee replacement all around the concept of, again, doing a preoperative plan, or actually in our case, an interoperative plan, because we, we relied on image-based or image-free, not image-based techniques to define where the implants would go for a knee replacement. And then we would apply our smart tool, which had a guard uh, at, the, at the tip of the tool and the burr would be retracted or extended relative to the guard in order to control the depth of cut live while the surgeon was cutting. So here's a picture here where the surgeon is simply burring and the system's keeping him honest by providing the right amount of depth control uh, the, from the standpoint of the surgical plan. And so you could use a round burr to achieve flat cuts uh, and arbitrary shapes and post holes and deep access. Uh, and Navio was successful and remains a success um, as part of Smith and Nephew. Uh, and that was the pr principal uh, technology that Smith and Nephew acquired uh, in order to support its wide-ranging uh, line of, of orthopedic implants. Uh, and it's still used today all around the world, even though it's it's kind of on its second generation, which is now called Cori. Uh, the, the basic technology remains uh, under the hood, but the, the PFS technology uh, now exists at Navio. But as a small startup company, um, we didn't always have a lot of funding for just Navio, and we needed to kind of scrap uh, get scrappy and, and, and try to survive. And so we pursued other endeavors. Uh, one of those endeavors, of course, was image overlay. Um, we had access to the technology through tech transfer at Carnegie Mellon. Um, we had the know-how, we had a lot of the source code. Uh, and so we tried to go at it and, and also turn image overlay into a product. And so you can see some of the attempts here uh, commercializing uh, image overlay 
uh, starting with uh, trying to wrap around some, some solid intellectual property. This is some of the napkin sketch sort of capabilities that we wrapped around our image overlay in a box um, to try to get some IP protection. And so you can see here that these concepts become professionally rendered patent drawings. And ultimately we did get a patent application published in 2006, um, but unfortunately that's as far as we took it. Uh, we didn't really uh, have the opportunity to take it any further than that. We were uh, unsuccessful at, at locking in the IP uh, and without IP, uh, a small startup company really often doesn't have the wherewithal to continue, and that's that's what happened with us. Fortunately, um, the bone cutting technology allowed us to, to proceed a little further, but unfortunately, we didn't get to have image overlay be part of uh, the Bluebell product line and, and be able to take it further from there. But we took a, did some prototypes. Uh, this is me here on the left building our cardboard sketch of a prototype, this time based around the stereographic monitor. Uh, so it was pretty cool to, to play around with new uh, auto stereoscopic displays. This is a monitor that, uh, or a laptop that was released by Sharp. Uh, and so if you had your eyes in just the right spot, you can get the stereo images that you need for the depth perception. Uh, and so we laid that out here and we built it in this large crane mounted unit here uh, gave you little eye holes to put your eyes in the right spot uh, and, and demonstrated uh, the capabilities of image overlay uh, without having to track your head. You can see here that we had a tiny little camera. Uh, this camera was made by a young company called Atraxis Technologies. Atraxis continued to kind of survive in parallel with Bluebell Technologies as a startup company. Uh, and ironically enough, actually was also purchased by Smith & Nephew uh, a couple years ago. Uh, and so uh, it's it's you know just as a kind of a side note, it's it's fun to see uh, kind of your colleagues across the pond and, and across the industry um, continue to develop their their capabilities and technologies, and, and you can make really lifelong friends um, in that way as well. So so it's it's a pleasure to work with those guys as part of Smith and Nephew, um, and we can always tell them and remind them that we bought camera number three from them way back in the day. So as I said, uh, Blue Belt never really got to commercialize uh, commercialize the image overlay technology. As far as we took it was this little video, uh, which if you'll indulge me, I will share. Uh, I'm going to actually make sure that my sound is working here because the soundtrack of this is, is quite precious. So I'll stop and then restart. Image Overlay is an augmented reality display device originally conceived for projection of medical data into the operative field during surgery. Models of both the surgical tools and preoperative images of the patient's anatomy can be projected into the scene in three dimensions, essentially giving the surgeon x-ray vision. Furthermore, real-time imagery such as endoscopic video can be presented in the surgical field so that the surgeon does not have to divert attention from the area of operation. Incorporation of other real-time imaging has allowed image overlay to be applied in specialties such as oncology. Here we see real-time ultrasound images of a breast phantom viewed with the images aligned with the ultrasound probe and projected at their true location within the breast. The upper left demonstrates the form factor of the device, which is suspended on a boom for easy manipulation during the procedure. In any application, tools may be tracked to augment the surgeon's view. Here we demonstrate the ability to track a biopsy needle while using ultrasound to visualize the lesion. Image overlay provides a view of the tool as well as a trajectory to simplify alignment of the needle path with the tissue target. Finally, we show the potential for image overlay to aid in performing advanced, minimally invasive procedures. This mock vascular structure twists and turns along a complex three-dimensional path. Now we obscure the vascular structure with simulated tissue. A mock catheter, outfitted with an electromagnetic position sensor, is introduced into the tubing. As the surgeon feeds the catheter into the body, the position and orientation of the catheter is tracked and displayed in three dimensions. To illustrate the vascular structure, the path of the catheter is displayed as well. Future smart catheters equipped with sensors could calculate parameters such as flow rate, temperature, and pressure. An image overlay could display these readings graphically for easy evaluation during the procedure. 
Image overlay is available in a variety of form factors and is applicable across the range of medical specialties. It may be coupled with existing surgical navigation systems or can be developed as a standalone application. Essentially, image overlay is designed to provide the necessary visualization for the future class of minimally invasive medical procedures. All right. Hopefully you guys all heard that and didn't have to listen in silence. Uh, and you can hear, uh, you know, that, that the great thing about being as a, a part of a startup is you get to wear many hats. Not only do you write software or put together PowerPoint presentations, but you also do some video editing and some voice narration on the side. And, and I look fondly back on those days uh, and just how, how fun it was to just, tr just try everything um, to try to get it to stick. Um, unfortunately, we didn't get this one to stick. Now the present. So here's, here's a picture of me with a HoloLens 2. Uh, Smith and Nephew here in my office. As I said, Smith and Nephew purchased Blue Belt um, primarily for our bone cutting technology. Um, the Navio system was, was very successful and, and at the time was kind of the major competitor of the Stryker Navio or the Stryker uh, Mako system. Uh, and uh, Smith and Nephew stepped into the realm of orthopedic robotics uh, with our acquisition and really um, let us continue to develop the product and, and and uh, they did a great job of kind of bringing us into the fold and giving us a little bit of uh, extra boost in the market. And so part of growing up at Smith and & Nephew in, in, in the later stages of Bluebell was, was really the appreciating, you know, how the sausage is made. You, you can work on the technology all you want, but as part of medical device, you have to really appreciate um, some of the medical device stuff, whether it's regulation and documentation and paperwork. Um, a lot of that has to do with learning how things work, particularly at the FDA. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we, we built our quality system. We had our regulatory team guide us through all of the hard times and getting the commercialization of the technology through. Um, and so we became very familiar with, with the FDA and its practices. Uh, and it's interesting to see uh, just last year that the FDA is turning its eyes toward uh, augmented reality uh, with the advent of the, the new headset capabilities, um, both VR and AR, um, the FDA is, is, is doing the right thing and, and, and trying to figure out the best way to do this. And, and fortunately, um, in 2020, they, they did their first seminar in order to bring uh, industry and academia into the fold and, and talk about the way that um, augmented reality would need to be supported. Uh, and unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to attend this workshop, um, but from what I hear, it was a, a great success. And uh, a lot of the takeaways from this that our team had and, and, and others, uh, where the FDA is looking at this, I, I think, in the right way. They see augmented reality as a powerful capability. Um, they see that it has a, it's set a unique set of challenges, uh, both technical and uh, from a usability perspective. Uh, and not every augmented reality technology is the same. And so these things have to be evaluated on a case specific basis, both for you know, case specificity around the surgical indication, whether it's orthopedics or neurosurgery or heart surgery, um, but also on a platform specific basis. You know, you have very lightweight uh, head mounted display, kind of a surgical assist technology that simply bring information into the operating room. And then you have the full mixed reality, immersive spatial computing environment, which is the dream, I think, of all of us here um, at this conference to, to, to really have uh, MR be part of uh, the surgical experience. Uh, and with that comes a high rate of performance that you need, uh, both from an accuracy and from a usability perspective. And so the FDA was looking in the right way. Uh, and so that's encouraging. Um, and we'll look to their guidance to continue. At the time of that conference, and this is an old slide, um, there are a few XR applications that had been released um, by a number of different companies uh, with a number of different applications. And, and this, this list has expanded significantly, uh, but it suffice to say now we can take augmented reality into the operating room, not just under an IRB, but it's being done. Uh, and, and so I decided to, to put together some of the ones that have come across my desk at Smith and Nephew and talk a little bit about those. Uh, and, and I think what, what I think are the, the, and the, the good things about each of the, the approaches. Uh, and so again, this will have an orthopedic bent to it. I'm sure that there are other applications out there, but um, 
the standpoint of the unique space of orthopedics and the specifics of the ergonomics, I figured I'd touch on this. Even though it's not considered orthopedics a lot of the times, um, um, spine surgery is, is one of the, you know, kind of the, the most innovative uh, surgical disciplines. Uh, and I wanted to make a mention of Augmedics, who at the time was the first AR surgical navigation system in the world uh, when I put these slides together. And if not now, there have been some, some fast followers that have come in the forefront, you know, especially in orthopedics. Um, but I wanted to tip my hat to, to the Augmetics team for putting together a great product uh, and a really great design, that, which I think thinks about the right things. Um, from my perspective, the X-Vision system has done a really good job of contemplating the unique needs of a surgeon, uh, the ergonomics of um, orthopedic surgery and spine surgery, um, the needs of the operating room with their, their um, their tracking marker kit uh, and uh, their user interface and, and the ecosystem that's there. So again, kudos to those guys. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to check out the automatic system, I highly recommend it. Right Medical, uh, which is now part of Stryker, um, has a, a mixed reality application for shoulder planning. Um, this is similar, uh, which to the to the brain lab visualization, in that this is not a navigation solution. Um, this is a uh, more of a surgical planning and surgical visualization technique, but certainly has a great wow factor, uh, and it really brings that three D nature of a three D problem into the operating room, uh, particularly in in the joint replacement, the shape of objects and appreciating their range of motion for sake of impingement, for sake of of, of normal range of motion. Uh, it is very important. And so this is one of the things that augmented reality does very well. Uh, and so I fully expect that, that uh, Bright Medical will follow this up with a, a surgical application um, to, to help navigate the procedure. Um, I'm not sure when it'll come out, I'd love to know. From an execution standpoint, Insight Medical is a, is a startup company that has recently got approved their Arvis system. Um, I think that the great thing about Arvis is that they really thought about kind of the existing market uh, within orthopedics and the ergonomics. They've, de they've developed a headset that is a specifically surgical headset that is compatible with surgical helmets today. All the sensing is, is on board and, and custom uh, and is compatible with, with the um, bulk of the, the helmet, the surgical helmet and, and toga setups. And they've recently released their their total knee application, I believe, and gotten that approved. Uh, and so they're working on growing their market here. But uh, again, I wanted to know, mention this one because of, of kind of the unique pro problem that they're solving and the way they're doing that. Pixie Medical has a similar uh, approved device. And when I say similar, I mean in the same domain as, as kind of a lightweight headset um, that again is, is looking to be compatible with surgical helmets. Um, this one, though, I think is, is unique in that it's leveraging off-the-shelf hardware as opposed to something custom. And the benefits of, of custom um, are that you, you know, can fine-tune it to your application, but the benefits of an off-the-shelf system allows you to take advantage of perhaps you know, more advanced iteration and capability uh, in the arms race that is uh, you know, head-mounted displays, uh, and then allow yourself to focus on instrumentation and software. And so um, Pixie has released... Uh, their knee system, I believe they're following it up quickly with the shoulder replacement application as well, um, leveraging the Vusix platform, uh, a neat little compact platform um, that that gives you, um, you know, pretty straight ahead uh, navigation uh, in a lightweight form factor. Adapta is another orthopedics company, and, and they're doing something interesting with leveraging kind of unique dis or unique tracking technology, um, but combining it with uh, augmented reality display, um, heads up display running on the Vuzix Blade, uh, I believe uh, the last I checked on it. And, and they've done kind of a neat combo and where they're, they're kind of introducing this new technology uh, for tracking in, in a lightweight uh, form factor and then coupling it with a lightweight display, uh, which is the glasses. And so this will be before they take this one. Almost last, but certainly not least, is, is the team from Portugal at uh, Perceive 3D. Um, just to speak a little bit to the, the arthroscopic talk um, that was given previously by Dr. Johnson, um, this is a, a slightly different application of augmented reality, but a really interesting one in which uh, the Perceive 3D team 
has developed tiny trackers that they were introducing into the joint um, to be tracked with the arthroscopy camera. So rather than in this being a head mounted display, they're actually doing AR on the video that they see inside the joint. Uh, and you can see a couple of examples that they have on YouTube uh, for them to collect points inside the joint and be able to do things like registering uh, preoperative CT or MRI to the joint, but see the, the navigation information overlaid accurately on the arthroscopy images um, because they're using those images to track and therefore they're as accurate as you're going to be there is as accurate as your tracking system. And for C3D, it has some unique capabilities too from the standpoint of image de-warping um, to, to kind of level the playing field from an arthroscopy perspective, perhaps solving some of those challenges when you're trying to look around the corner with a fisheye lens on a 70 degree angle, um, making those sorts of adoptions of techniques or uh, arthroscopy um, a little easier to adopt that I think is an interesting idea. And for C3D is also demonstrated at the AAOS conference, um, some external video-based navigation capabilities to some mobile device navigation, et cetera. So uh, this is. And finally, uh, I think that the uh, holosurgical uh, surgeline system, surgeline just recently acquired holosurgical, I think in the last year or so, um, has, has a, an interesting form factor. Again, using some, some novel display technologies uh, to project images into the surgical environment. Um, I think that this, is, this one is probably my favorite of all the, the technologies that I've reviewed, um, probably because it seems familiar uh, and is, is hopefully validating some of the concepts that we put together a, a little while back. Um, but of course, a flat panel monitor and a simple beam splitter are, are no match probably for the sorts of technology that they put inside their box today. And, and kudos to Hall Surgical for getting um, this into the operating room and getting acquired and, and introducing this into a fairly critical application. So what about Smith and Nephew? What is Smith and Nephew doing? Well, uh, our flagship AR effort uh, is a collaboration with the Imperial College of London. Uh, and so I'll show a series of, of short videos um, and the first of which will be narrated by Hisham Iqbal, who's a doctoral candidate at uh, Imperial College, and uh, demonstrating some of the work they've done in incorporating AR as kind of a module, a kind of an assistive technology in, in connection with an existing off-the-shelf system, namely the Navio system. So um, <clears throat> the Imperial team has a Navio, and we gave them some hooks to tap into the software, but not, not too many hooks. And they've done a great job in demonstrating a number of different capabilities in AR that are um, uh, kind of connected to the things that are done in Navio so that we can evaluate kind of how much of a level up is this from the standpoint of traditional navigation, planning, image registration, et cetera, um, whenever you add uh, augmented reality. So here's the first one. This is a technical demonstration prepared for Smith and Nephew. This video will showcase a HoloLens app controlled by gestures and voice commands. Today, we're going to transfer some aspects of the Navio workflow over into a virtual workspace. Let's have a look at what aspects of the workflow we have access to. Navigation. As you can see in this window, I have access to five different aspects of the workflow today. Let's bring up one of these windows. Tibia removal. As you can see here, this is an information panel taken from a Navio console. Currently, this virtual panel is programmed, so it always follows my gaze. This means wherever I look, the panel will follow me. This allows me to look at the patient and information panel simultaneously. However, if I want to take a closer look at the patient, I can fix this window. I simply look at where I want to place it in space and gesture with a click and now the window is fixed. This allows me to look at the patient in more detail and look back at the information. Let's get a few more windows up. Navigation, gap assessment, navigation, point collection. An additional factor of these windows is that they're programmed to always orient themselves towards the user. This means if a surgeon is to travel around a patient, the windows will automatically rotate themselves so that they will always face the surgeon. 
However, if these windows are not in an ideal position for reading any longer, you simply hover over the move icon and gesture with a click. Once again, the window is tethered to your gaze and you're free to move it around and fix it somewhere else in space. So that's the first is demonstrating some some neat display technology uh, and, and I'm happy to hand the microphone over to Hisham because he has a much cooler accent than I do. The team from ICL uh, has done some research not only in just building these and, and getting you know individuals feedback but but looking at the ergonomics of AR and the uh, efficiencies uh, around some novel surgical applications, in this case, uh, osteochondral legion repair. Uh, they presented this work at the Hamlin Symposium. I recommend checking it out. They've done some nice work. And they even did some, some uh, use case or some, some ergonomic studies at one of the conferences, pulling a bunch of surgeons in. Uh, so I recommend checking that work out. Here's a more um, demonstration of some of the things that they've done with Navio. So this is the Navio pointer collection. Uh, a pointer probe uh, collecting data on the surface of the, the bone with you know, the, the, what you would expect with an augmented reality display. Uh, the standard Navio screen, which is just kind of points being collected relative to a 3D model, is shown off to the right, but you see the sort of uh, overlays that um, surgeons typically ask for whenever they think about augmented reality and think about what they can do to stop looking off to the right at a separate screen. And so a lot of this work is, is you know, evaluating those, uh, those concepts. And, and uh, one of the things that's interesting though is, is one of the you know, current failures with, with augmented reality is the lack of kind of perfect integration of data into the field. You see that these points are being drawn on top of the bone, but unfortunately also on, on top of Hisham's hand here. Uh, this is one of the things that we need to overcome, I think, in, in, in kind of the final the final capability of the systems to be completely integrated in the operating room environment, to be completely inter integrated into the real world. Occlusion has to work. If the points are below your hand, you shouldn't be able to see them through your hand. Otherwise, that, that sense of immersion, that sense of realism is lost. Here's a concept around uh, registering the point surface. And again, you're, you're playing around with the ideas of painting and seeing your points on the bone versus perhaps in a secondary display next to the bone um, you know, is, is an interesting contrast because now the issues with occlusion and issues of blocking the, the patient uh, go away, um, but the ability to have 3D rendered objects uh, and you know, being able to place them ideally relative to your workspace as opposed to off to the side on a monitor uh, is realized. So, so here's some more. Uh, interesting work being done uh, in, in trying some of these concepts out. And another application around surgical planning. So here's our bone model that we've defined in the operating room. And so rather than using the, the standard or sagittal transverse coronal view uh, that Navio employs, why not do this in three dimensions virtually? Um, so you can see the sort of uh, manipulation of the implant on the screen translating to kind of a 3D uh, manipulation uh, here. Uh, and, and certainly that manipulation of moving the implant around could be coded into the augmented reality uh, application as well. And finally, because we are a bone cutting application, ultimately they, uh, the team has also mocked up some, some cutting interfaces where they've explored the ideas of doing some guidance um, the idea with this arrow is to give the surgeon direction as to which part of the bone, in this case, is the thickest so that they can approach that part of the bone first, kind of as, a, as an assist to help surgeons understand how they could be most efficient in cutting. And again, this one employs the off to the side interface as opposed to uh, an overlay onto the patient because you can imagine that the color map that we employ um, coupled with um, you know, the, the trickiness of doing sorts of transparency, et cetera, would be hard to put directly onto the bone surface, particularly when your tool is, is blocking your view uh, a good part of the time.
Uh, Smith and Nephew doesn't only have a robotics division. There are a number of other divisions, the orthopedic implants division, the wound management division, and also uh, the trauma division. And, and I will give a shout out to the guys in trauma uh, that have also been working in augmented reality. Uh, this is a Magic Leap application they put together kind of as a translation from a, a mobile navigation kind of iPad-based uh, approach where they're navigating um, fixation of, of, of a, a repair plate. Uh, they move that um, to an augmented reality application, kind of just taking all the compute and all the display and putting that into a magic leaf. And, and so um, interesting uh, translation. Uh, I would say, personally, I tried this out. And, and for me, augmented reality in this case is kind of cool, but isn't actually giving me a whole lot from the standpoint of the simplicity of a, an iPad or another Android or an Android device. Um, to me, having the bones, uh, or sorry, having the plates overlaid onto the exact plate um, may prove actually in the way as opposed to having a bit of a, of a navigation assist off to the side. Um, this is my own opinion, um, just after using it one time. But again, these are the exact sort of issues that we have to come across when we try to translate this into the real world. Like, even though you can do overlay, even though it seems cool, is it actually making the procedure easier? Is it actually seamlessly integrated into the application? And this is what we have to ask ourselves when we take it over the finish line. Finally, just to kind of uh, put a bow on the uh, augmented reality around Smith and Nephew, um, this is a, a prototype application, once again, leveraging video-based tracking, but again, in combination with um, some more traditional navigation capabilities. So this is a prototype that we put together back in 2018, um, just trying to see if a, if a small table mounted camera is compelling is, is a, a form factor from a surgical navigation perspective. Uh, we found that the nice thing about this is it was fairly accurate, certainly capable from a navigation accuracy requirement perspective. Uh, the great thing about using a camera like this is it takes simple video input, so it's very translatable uh, to other sorts of devices. Um, but straight video is, is tricky, particularly in the operating room. Um, lighting matters. Um, backlighting um, is uh, required for this setup. Um, we have to put a ring light around this camera. Uh, and of course, these markers are made out of paper. You would have to have markers that are going to su survive the rigors of the operating room. And, and some of the previous slides um, from groups like Pixie and Perceive 3D, they've worked through those engineering problems. And um, when you're in the lab and you can print out markers on paper and do it, that's fine. But a lot of the hard work is making sure that you can sterilize those markers more than three times. So that it's not costing you hundreds and hundreds of dollars per case in order to, to supply the, the parts. So just a quick wrap up, um, since I'm running short on time, really at the end, I wanted to touch on, are we there yet? So, you know, I, I spoke a little bit about some of the, the limitations that we have today, you know, the occlusion issues and some of the display issues. And really, I think the big question um, is, are we there at Minority Report? It seems to me that everybody that talks about AR is really trying to get to the capabilities that are demonstrated in Minority Report and, and as uh, Previous speakers showed, um, you know, Iron Man, the idea uh, of having the spatial computing aspects of the interfaces and the interactions with the real world are super compelling and really sexy. Um, and you know, we're, we're trying to get there. Uh, we certainly not as cool as what was in the movies, um, but we're, we're working our way towards that. But in order to get there for real, I think that we're still missing a few things. Um, the accuracy, in my experience, from the systems that are out there now are good for general navigation purposes. So it, to use an AR headset as an, a navigation system, in some applications, it's probably accurate enough. But I don't think we're at the point from a so, full system end-to-end -end kind of eye-to-pixel uh, capability. We're not really ready for true mixed reality. The images are still very difficult to align perfectly with your surgical view. Um, the limitations of current display technologies of putting virtual objects at a precise focal plane are still lacking. As companies like Magic Leap and, and Lightspace are working on this, um, but right now everything is still kind of a 2D decal that's pasted on top of the real world. And, and for full immersion, we need to get over that hump. And finally, I touched on occlusion. You know, when things go below something else, they need to disappear. That's the only way it seems real. And, and so 
companies are working on this, but I haven't seen yet a system, particularly in, in medicine, it's, it's doing this really well. And finally, the challenges um, that will continue to be there until someone solves this problem, finally, um, are, are the practical issues. Um, integration with the surgical helmet is key, and Insight and Pixie have been working on this, but PPE, especially in today's environment, is increasingly important. And so you can't reach inside of your helmet and adjust your glasses. You have to be able to, to have these things be comfortable, they have to be adjustable, and they have to not be touched once you started operating. And, and the AR headsets have to work within the ergonomic workflow of the procedure. You can't have a 10 minute setup time and have to a kind of an intermission of, of 10 minutes in the middle to change some configuration. It has to fit in the surgical workflow because time is money in the operating room and even more so than real money. And I say that because equipment, it's nice to be cheap, but if you save 10 minutes per surgery and you pay an extra you know, $100,000 uh, for the device, they'll probably pay the $100,000 on the device so they can save 10 minutes for every single surgery and so that the surgeon has fun. And really, ultimately, this has to be fun. Um, you've got to make this, the procedure enjoyable for the surgeon. They have to feel like they're getting something out of it that can't be a pain in the neck. Uh, and so you need to make this compelling. Uh, and I'm sure Dr. Johnson um, probably is more tolerant than some of the others um, that we've worked with, Smith and Nephew. Um, this has to be easy to use, it has to be integrated, and it has to make you feel like Tom Cruise. So thanks for your time, appreciate the opportunity to speak, and uh, if you guys want to field questions now, that's cool, or we can wait for after Jonathan's talk, it's up to you guys. Uh, thank you very much for the talk, uh, which covered both your uh, career and uh, also very nice uh, summary of the uh, products that are out there in the market or entering the market. Um, if there are some questions, uh, I would be happy to forward them to Costa. Uh, so there is a question from the audience here. Uh, the microphone is there. Hi. <clears throat> Hello, Costa. This is uh, Leo Josku with him from uh, Zurich. Very, very nice talk. I think uh, it was very comprehensive and very informative. Congratulations for that. Um, thank, you, thank you very much. It's great to hear from you again, Dr. Yes. Joskowitz. I'm very uh, impressed by how you followed this up. Uh, I was particularly interested in the slide you had about the 510K approval of the different system. It's very encouraging to see that uh, uh, all these systems have been approved. Uh, if you can give a little bit of detail in terms of the class one, class two devices and how they manage, what was required by the FDA in your understanding uh, to basically uh, uh, get these uh, devices approved. You can pick one of them or an example. It would be interesting to know. Um, I can't say that I know for sure, uh, and perhaps maybe at the Augmentics talk uh, tomorrow, that he can, if it's Nissan, he can speak more specifically about the details. But I would say that I think that AR systems are being probably conceived uh, like navigation systems. So the needs to show that the information is true, um, you're achieving your accuracy, and you're not going to hurt the patient are there. Uh, and um, the class two nature of those systems, I think, is right along the lines of what you would see. But again, this is this is really application specific. If you are doing a procedure using AR that is going to I don't know, potentially stop your heart or give you know damage your spine or your brain, um, you're going to ratchet up that to a class three device, likely. Um, but for orthopedic navigation, I think that this is something that is well understood provided you meet all the requirements that the typical navigation systems would do, as well as consider the usability aspects, which I think are, is the main thing that's fairly novel um, for AR relative to the, the you know, decades we've put into the navigation world. Thank you. So the predicate device would be a navigation. You would basically try to compare that to the navigation, and this is already well known, and this is how you would go ahead with yeah, if I put my regulatory hat on, uh, which I'm probably not very qualified to do, um, I would go with that approach because essentially 
for the most part, these AR devices are navigation systems. They just have a different sensor deployment mechanism and a different display capability. But the intent is to align instruments uh, according to some sort of surgical plan. Uh, and so, you know, if you've got a headset that's got kind of, you know, dual video that's tracking image markers, um, it starts to look a lot like, you know, your standard brain lab or Medtronic navigation system. Uh, can I ask the question? Do you have a question? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, thanks again. Uh, it's really great, great presentation and a lot of valuable uh, work you have done throughout your career. Uh, you. One question I had, Costas, uh, Nick, is about the fact that, uh, you know, do you know how many of these systems could be running without a company technician? or a trained technician required to be there and do calibration or adjustment or menuing? You know, how many of them have you seen that they are self, completely self, uh, you know, that the doctor can just put it, use it without any, you know, after a short training, without any assistance? I, I have rarely seen that. I don't know if you have experience with that. Yeah, I, I, I think it depends on the surgeon. Uh, honestly, uh, you know, some surgeons are remarkably fluent in the technology. Um, you know, they run their own system. They want to run their own system. The rep is in the room in the case of orthopedics to kind of manage the implants and the surgical trays. Um, but, you know, the rep may simply wheel the thing in and the surgeon runs away with it. Uh, that's our, the case of, of Navio for us. Uh, and, you know, from what I hear um, from, you know, some of the, the new technologies, uh, this is the case with, with, you know, early adopters and some of these capabilities. Um, I will say that in my career, I've come across surgeons that need help and they want help and they look at these sorts of technologies almost in a concierge perspective where they don't want to have to do the work they expect that the work is done for them. Um, I guess, to quote one of the doctors who I'll remain lameless, um, I just bought a million dollar robot. Why do I need to plan? Like those sorts of, of perspectives are real. Uh, and so that's a, that's a key thing for adoption is to make it as simple to use. Um, I would say that it's a relatively small percentage of surgeons that are not going to want some sort of support or help. Um, but particularly when you're getting into the AR space, they can't necessarily click the screen for you or kind of you know what to do unless you design the system to have sort of a, a kind of a secondary assist to kind of a parallel uh, control that is, is appropriate. So either that's a second headset or perhaps a more traditional navigation system that is able to drive the UI. Are there modern questions? Because otherwise I have a continue a continuation yes, to yes. ask. One question. <laughs> so let me uh, just, ask, just ask you one more thing. So. In the continuation of this discussion, one of my problems with the AR systems that in medical we currently have is that they are not uh, able, the systems are not able to understand the surgical workflow. And they, therefore, the doctor needs to interact with them to, to say where I am, what I want. And that's where, in cases I have seen, that's where they then start to use the assistants or uh, technicians because they're busy with their workflow and the system does not understand that they moved from a step one to a step two to a step three to a step four automatically and how to adjust with them. So do you see the need or how do you approach that of under of the systems being more intelligent semantically to understand what's going on? Yeah, I, I see that there is opportunity there. And I know that there are groups that are working on exactly that sort of awareness where the systems may appreciate a particular instrument has been brought into the field or they recognize um, a particular type of image um, and, and see that, oh, you know, this image has changed. They must have changed kind of what they were doing, for instance, for example, of a changing of a portal in an orthoscopic um, procedure, where all of a sudden you're looking at a tibia instead of a femur. So I must have switched to this part of the workflow, and therefore I'm going to reconfigure the software. Um, easier said than done, of course, um, but certainly 
um, what surgeons would like because clicking buttons and telling the system what to do, particularly with clunky things like voice commands um, or gestures uh, and kind of still today's uh, capability um, are challenging and frustrating potentially for users. Thank you very much. Thanks for a great talk and intervention today. Pass it to Matt. Uh, yeah, there's another question by Eddie Edwards. Um, you talk about occlusion being a big problem, but for some guidance applications, you want to see structures beneath the physical surface. Do you think that perception can be achieved? I do. I think that, you know, that'll have kind of a, the, the ideal solution there is going to be in making sure that the reality of perception and, and what it takes to perceive things as being through a few layers potentially um, will be important, right? So as you look through thicker parts of the body, things should become potentially more trans or more invisible, for instance. Um, or if you're going to completely wash out the system in order to see truly um, uniquely what you're looking at things below the surface, somehow canceling what is above is going to be very important. And this will be different with optical see-through displays versus video see-through displays. Um, video has that power to kind of remove or cancel or shift pixels that are coming through video image in, in a very direct way. Um, but you know, you've got to get the video stereoscopy correct. You've got to make sure that the focal depths are not distracting um, or optical. You have to you have the real world and so you somehow have to blend with the real world and, and things like lighting and, and such are are really critical to get right so i think it's possible but again it just provides perfect understanding of of that perception what what do you want to see when you're looking through the patient or having x-ray vision and what do you have to do to get there thank you um maybe a quick uh, last question from my side um because we've been uh, discussing and it came up a couple of times. And of course, it's a, a, one of the main factors for uh, delicate surgical procedures, the accuracy. Uh, and we were discussing about current systems. And I, would, I, I was interested this uh, the image overlay system, the first one. Uh, can you give any information of how the, the registration or display accuracy of the system was? Um from memory uh and this was based on memory of looking at it because ultimately we only took it as far as trying to get it to look as good as possible um a few millimeters uh and that was error in registering the surgical images or the surface models to the models in front of us um as well as you know imperfections in the optics and, and the trickiness of manually calibrating both your eye position and the structure of the headset I do remember implementing lots of point collection routines where I would put my pointer probe at a dot and I would do that for 30 dots to try to figure out what plane of vision was there. And it was never perfect. It was only good enough to demo. Um, we never did any sort of um, rigorous analysis on that um, because the projects just never went far enough to, to kind of evaluate those. And that's kind of what happens when you're trying to do cool stuff and trying to gain interest, but ultimately don't have that that pathway to commercialization uh, or to you know the goal of a of a research paper at least to to validate that work. Um, you know, image overlay was never really funded that way, uh, and because we didn't have the kind of commercial runway, we never had to to nail down all the numbers. Uh, it was really about kind of drumming up interest, which is why you saw that great video that we put together uh, of, of extolling all of its virtues. Uh, Costa, I wanted to tell you something because I, in my classes, I teach your AR window system of 98. Uh, but then when I follow that, I tell them that there are two German companies who actually built it and brought it to real surgery. Do you yeah. know about them? Do you know Medarpa and ARCs? They were two systems which took to your, uh, which actually took your concept of AR window between 2000 and 2005 and build it completely and brought it to also a surgery in Munich, a maxofacial surgery. Uh, do, do you know about them and uh, were you aware of their, uh, do you know that they took that and brought it to some product? They didn't succeed. Uh, in, in my classes, I explained that <laughs> I believe that the main problem at that time they had 
was uh, they had too many components and uh, they had to recal for recalibration, it would take them 20 minutes. And this was not acceptable with the surgery, but they found it really, really valuable and useful. And I think those these shortcomings could have been solved with the advance of technology. But just to ask you, were you aware of those German companies who took that and tried to grow, bring it farther? I was not aware of those. I mean, we've seen this similar content, which, you know, it's it's not rocket science. You know, it's a it's Pepper's ghost, right? It's a half silvered mirror in an image. Uh, and so whether they were inspired by our technology or developed it on their own, um, good for them. I'm glad that they were able to kind of get it to a product stage. It, it wasn't in the cards for us, but it just goes to show that, you know, sometimes you can be too early. Uh, you know, in our case, we were too early and didn't have the wherewithal to generate enough money and, and interest around it to take it to a company those guys took it to a company and just they weren't there yet from the standpoint of the um the components and the technology polysurgical has the same sort of form factor but maybe with their projective technology and you know another decade's worth of industrial design and surgical experience they they can get it over the line who knows um it's it's very interesting to see how these things shake out. I, I'm not sure whether or not I feel good or bad about the fact that they didn't make a lot of money from it, um, because uh, you know there's always that uh, wish it were us sort of aspect. But uh, clearly, um, I'm, I'm hoping that AR gets it over the line, and maybe one of these new companies that's got it out there is is going to be that be that success story. I will send you those videos about those companies, but you are too modest. I always say, you know, after invention and after doing it, when you did it in 97, 98, uh, it's easy to say that this is obvious, but only after the invention, not before the yeah. invention. That's yeah. right. And, and, and I'll continue to be modest because I came into that lab with that prototype already built and running. My job was just to kind of tweak the code a little bit. Um, but that was my predecessors at CMU, a, a bunch of great guys that, that, you know, really kind of paved the way for my career. So uh, Mike Blackwell, Dave Simon, Dr. DeJoya, Dr. Yermes, uh, just Thank great, you. great folks that had a lot of success. David Simon just retired through a long and illustrious career from kind of sophomore Danic to Medtronic Navigation. So I, I came from a really um, special group. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your contribution. Thanks. Thank you.